what you're about to hear is very similar to what you've heard all morning. A group of dedicated people trying to expand out into the community, get the community involved, and the community starts with school children and reaches to OAP. And that's, for me, all of the things that's been happening this morning. If you think of what they've been doing or speaking, who have all been speaking. I've got here, oh, oh, sorry, I have this little booklet. They're lying over there. There are 40 of these, so you can help yourself when you're finished. It's called Rock Rider, and it's about the saint who came to Inchinnan in 597, and then subsequently on. This booklet here has just come off the publisher's run, and I have very few of them. There's only about 10 of them because this was a wee trial run with the publisher, but that tells you more about the story. Uh, this is what it was all about. 597, 14, if you take 1420 and add 597, you'll come to last year, and that's when the project actually took place. It was two, two years for us to get ourselves organised. That is going and knocking the lottery's door and the HES's door and a number of other uh, funders, and then finding the right people and the professional people to support us. And it's one of the professional people, that is Heather James, who's going to speak to you about the archaeological side of what the project actually uh, showed. This is the church as it was uh, before it was demolished. It was demolished in 1966. The those are wanting to try and tie themselves down. If you know where Glasgow Airport is, the runway for Glasgow Airport starts about 200 metres from the right-hand side of that picture. Consequently, I had to come down. This is an artist impression of front end of uh, the 20th century of what St. Convo looked like. He's supposed to have came from Ireland on a stone, hence what you see him sitting on. So that, that's the story about it. And the little church that he's holding in his hand is very like what uh, the previous church to the one I've just shown you. This is why we as a, com uh, a community group get involved in this. We were trying to get, we're saying to ourselves, when you see some of the pho photographs of the place, there is nothing really to see, absolutely nothing. But it is a, a scheduled monument. So the first question has got to be, why is it a scheduled monument when you can't see anything? There's nothing to see. And that's what started us. When you start looking back, Roy has a map of Kirton, which shows some houses around about the church. So could we find them? And as the bottom line says, there are three churches. While, while St. Conville came in, 597, probably uh, Wattle and Wood. This is uh, Roy's map. Then there was a stone-built church somewhere in the 1100s, and then that lasted to 1828 when the one that with St. Conville was holding was demolished, and then the last one was on. So what were the community initiatives of this particular project? Well, we wanted to carry out the, the, uh, an archaeological dig to see if we could find anything, really. We wanted to record the gravestones, uh, and if you go to the website MyInchinnan.org UK, and you will see there is a map of the, grave, the graveyards, that, click on that, and all the information you want to find out about the gravestones will be there. The other thing was that the, uh, the church that got demolished had a lot of stained glass windows in it. They were moved and put into the current church. So we then decided we'd try and find out about that. We wanted to get involved, school children involved uh, in the project, really to learn much more about the history and really we, if getting the children to uh, engage. The Archaeology Scotland were encouraging people to get involved in archaeology and the school kids were get involved in that. This is our original open day of launching the project. This is the lady who, in our group, uh, that is our uh, uh, specialist, who 
coordinated the school activity, and that's our launch day. This is our Heather, our speaker on the archaeological side, the formal photograph of when we were going to start the dig. This is a map of what we eventually built up. There's a lot of information on this, unless you take your time and look at it. But we've got the outline of the 1828 church, we've got the 1904 church, the orange blob that you see in the middle, we eventually got from the geophys, uh, but we had carried out a dig by then. The orange blob may or may not be the 1100 church. We are very, we are looking on it skeptically, but it's a bit bigger than what we think it ought to be. But there we are, and you'll see on there all the graves. That uh, chart is on the website. The other thing was the glass. This is one of the stained glass windows in the current church. Uh, it's, this is the kids being involved in the Hero Award. And this is, uh, uh, who do you call her, Beverly Ballin Smith of the Archaeology Scotland came along and presented them. This is one of the certificates that they got. And there was 400 and odd Youngsters got these certificates from five different schools. This is just a photograph at the day that the presentation of the awards were put on. And this is one young fella who is in roughly year six telling you what he got out of the project. And the impressive part of this, when his name was shouted, he just came down, punk in here, and away he went with a presentation. So there we are. So what was the impact in the community? Well, it gave a lot of volunteering opportunities and learning new skills. Uh, we learned how to get involved in taking photographs to allow us to do photogrammetry. We also learned about how to do uh, effective uh, transfer and imaging, RTI, and various other things. So what we were really doing there was understanding how to see uh, the modern, using modern technology to let us look back the way to allow us to come forward again. It gave us a good bit of community cohesion because there's a lot more people now involved in our group and you just see it in, in the community itself. The whole thing is better. Here's the kids at the... Uh, down at the site. This part that you can see, a uh, bit of wall, is really the only bit of the building you can see. Here are the kids doing a bit of working here. Here's one of the trenches we had open, and they're having a look at it. This here is Gilbert Marcus, is the fella in the green. He's a historian, and he dug out some hymns, sorry, some chants of St. Convo's time, and this is one little session of him encouraging this group to uh, uh, sing the hymn that he'd put together. And the fella, not sitting down, but the fella immediately behind him is the Renfrewshire Council leader. So a lot of in here just to let you know that the volunteers did get down on their hands and knees and get dirty. Uh, we would done it in the sunshine and we'd done it in the rain. This is uh, Clara uh, Sanchez from Spectrum Heritage, who was one of the trainers for us doing a bit of the uh, work. Here is a 3D model of that stone that was taken from the stuff that she actually put together. This is our, one of our members at night doing the photographing for the ITI. And uh, I think what else have we got after that? Here's the ladies cleaning the finds. And here they're working hard. <laughs> and here's, here we're back at the school kids. This is the kids that are really involved with this. And the final thing for me, because I think that's the last slide, yes. This is what came out of it. This is a hard copy of the what we return as our legacy project, which is a booklet to allow the children to
to carry on and do uh, historical research. So the teachers have been involved in this and all our professionals in this. So this is a hard copy of it. So that's my part of it. Heather will now tell you the archaeological part. So as you say, this is a lovely painting of the site before it was demolished, and you can see the slight mounds that it sits on uh, right beside the river. So I wanted to talk about the impact, and I think there are three points I wanted to make about the archaeological impact. One is that there are deep deposits surviving on site. The second is that it, it's associated with the Govan School, and uh, we enhanced that. And the third was the education pack, which Bill mentioned briefly there. So just looking, talking about that in a little bit more detail. Um, you see on the right-hand side there, there's the three images we have of the three churches. Um, the one at the bottom is, is the one that was in place in the early 19th century, the one that was demolished in 1828. The one above that is the one that was built in 1828. And the one above that is the one that was built in 1904. Uh, all these were demolished, and uh, if you go look at the picture on the left, that's what you see when you're on the site. You can actually see the runway, um, just the lights beyond, beyond there. So I did warn the community. I said, well, after all that, it, the, the possibility of there being nothing left is quite high. So we'll do this project, and I think HLF agreed, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly put, uh, put the money in for this project, but if you don't find anything, then that, that's going to be it, you know. So um, I'm delighted to say that was not the case because we did find uh, deep archaeological deposits. This is a, a quick view of the location of the trenches. As you see, there are four in uh, the area of the graveyard and one in the what we call the Mance Green, which is just north of the Mance, and there's one further north as well, which I won't talk about. So, yes, deep archaeological deposits, but uh, quickly about the 1904 church, you can see the remains of the uh, little bit of upstanding walls. You can see on the right-hand side there, there's sort of a bit of the aisle, uh, it, the floor of the aisle inside, and uh, on the bottom left, I, I'm very fond of this bit, it's the porch step, which was there in 1960s, and we have people coming to site uh, who had been married in the church, and there's photographs for, or, or from their wedding, so it's a really nice connection with the local community there, so that's the 1904. We also found evidence of the 1828 church in the form of a really deep, uh, deeply buried wall, which you can see at the top left there, and this is, um, if you look at the map on the right, this is the very straight bit of the wall at the top. That's uh, finding that bit of straight wall, which was then, that was demolished itself in uh, 1904, so that was enhanced. So this is, um, this is uh, the 1828 church. We also found in the bottom left corner there, we were allowed to dig through the concrete floor, not, a, not the aisle, but certainly through the concrete under the pews part. And we found a corner there which relates to the 1828 church. Uh, the deposits there mostly uh, we'd say a lot of stained glass, which we got very excited about. And um, so we have sort of two main bits. We've got certainly we have it, we've had it dated with Helen Spencer from the Herit Watt University. She could identify from the recipe, she could date it. So we have uh, the painted glass is definitely from the 1900s. Uh, the one below that, the amber blue and the clear, is from 1700 to 1830, which perfectly fits with the 1828 church. And we also had some earlier. Uh, stained glass, which is probably 16th century as well, so that's very exciting. Another useful dating evidence was the carved stones. We collected all these, and these have been looked at by Mary Marcus, who's an expert in uh, medieval carved stones. Uh, she identified several pieces which could be of architectural interest. Um, unfortunately, nothing earlier than the 15th century. So if there was a, a stone church there prior to the 16th, 15th century, we haven't got any evidence of it yet but uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So certainly there was sort of building, uh, important building happening in the 15th century, of which we have this evidence. Going deep, uh, beneath the floor of the 1904 church, we dug down, as you can see, there's lots of demolition debris in that form of the uh, yellow stones, <coughs> which contained this 15th century material. Coming down onto a dark soil, that's at least a meter down, and that's a kind of uh, burial deposit. Uh, within that, we were finding tiny fragments of bone. So in order to avoid uh, uh, digging any bone, we, the, the trench got smaller and smaller. And you see that bottom left-hand corner there, that's the only bit we could go down, 1.8 meters, still not onto bedrock. And uh, just as I was cleaning the section, of course, just at the very bottom, that's the skull that, that, that was exposed. So that's not been touched. 
So bone does survive there really well. Uh, it's at least 1.82 meters in depth. <coughs> we have other um, remains. This is in one of the other trenches. Very tenuous possible remains of an oval-shaped uh, enclosure wall. Again, that was one and a half meters deep. So again, very exciting, but very deep. So my second point was about the new gov the Govan school, new stones discovered. These are from the Govan, um, old, Govan old um, church. Very important uh, to the uh, kingdom of Strathclyde. So uh, lots of carving going on there. We have three stones from Chinon. These have all been moved to the new church. So we have, uh, the one on the right there is possibly a shrine cover for St. Conwell. So a very, still an important site for, of Inchinan. One other new stone was found in 2010. So this is called Inchinan 4. And, uh, and we have found Inchinan 5. Well, not to say we, it wasn't me. Um, one of these medieval gravestones, known as the Templar Stones, was actually found to... This is Megan Caston of University of Glasgow was doing some work on the stone. She's looking at the, scan, the RTI scans, and she identified a governed stone from one of these. So this is now another governed stone, which just enhances the archaeology of, of the site, really. <coughs> um, so my third point, really, was the education pack that uh, Bill mentioned there briefly. Um, education is very important, and we recognize that schools nowadays trying to uh, react to the curriculum for excellence, the, the teachers are so under pressure to, be, you know, to, to have stuff, they haven't got time to uh, do a lot of research themselves. They want something that's basically uh, class ready. They want to pick it up and go straight to class. So we've got, we put together what I hope to be something that will be useful for them. It's about the project, but it's a bit more wide ranging, and it has... Um, it's got a, a, a section on for the teachers to kind of uh, background reading for them, a little bit of um, quite a, a, a section on the, the whole project. We've got sort of um, uh, a section on the uh, worksheets so they can just print them off straight away, take them straight into class. And we've got a PowerPoint presentation which again can go straight into class which has all the images that they need. It's very flexible. They can pick and choose the topics they want to have. Um, this is something that uh, uh, Katie Firth um, started, and uh, when she was very selfishly got pregnant and had two twins, uh, unfortunately I then had to finish off. So uh, I've done my best, so hopefully uh, it, 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 it's, it's okay. So I'd be ha happy to get feedback from anybody who's got teaching experience about whether that's um, helpful or not. So we have, this is a primary school uh, a pack, and we're, we're just about to start a, a, se a secondary one. So. So that's my talk. Thank you very much.